Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service of worship here in St. Columbus. Uh, it's good to see so many uh, gathered in our church, and to those of you who are watching uh, the live stream on YouTube, we bid you all a very warm welcome in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you happen to be visiting with us this morning, we're especially delighted to welcome you in the name of our Lord as you join with us in worship. And do take the greetings of St. Columbus to your home congregations. Next week, as you know, the Scottish Government is seeking to further uh, relax the uh, regulations covering uh, our meetings, and uh, I'm glad to announce that next Sunday we will be able to double the capacity that we can accommodate here in our church building. So if you're sitting at home watching, uh, know that there will be plenty of room for you to come and join with us uh, next Sunday here in the church, and we look forward to welcoming more of you back uh, in the coming weeks. Our midweek meeting, as usual, takes place by Zoom on Thursday, meeting at 7 for 15 minutes, coffee and chat, followed by our midweek uh, Bible study and prayer meeting. And on Friday, we're delighted to share in the celebrations as uh, Jenny and Douglas exchange their marriage vows here in the church, and we look forward to celebrating that occasion with them. And do remember them in your prayers as they commence their married life together. For those of you who get the Life and Work magazine, the copies are in the vestibule. Please collect them as you leave. And also there are a number of newsletters from Highland Theological College and uh, the summer newsletter from Slavic Gospel Association. So please feel free to take one of these and pray for the college and pray for the work of the Slavic Gospel Association. Uh, we commend those to you. The psalmist says, Clap your hands, all people. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord the Most High is to be feared, a great king above all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. So let us do that as we come to commence our worship uh, by singing from the words of Psalm 122. I joyed when to the house of God go up, they said to me, Jerusalem within thy gates, our feet shall standing be. Let us stand and praise God.
us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, we do indeed uh, join with the psalmist in rejoicing that we can come to your house in order to raise our hearts and voices in praise and worship of the one who is our God, the one who is our creator, the one who is our redeemer, and the one who is our friend. Lord, we marvel that your creation and all that you have provided us with for our good and for our blessing. Your word reminds us that that you finished the work of creation, you declared it to be very good. We know that our first parents joined close fellowship and communion with you before they chose to disobey you and sin against you. And we know that the consequences of that are that we live in a broken and a damaged world, a world which is not as you originally intended it should be. But we thank you as our catechism reminds us you didn't leave us in our state of sin and misery, that even as you executed your righteous wrath and judgment in putting Adam and Eve out of the garden, you promised to send a saviour one who would restore and recreate what had been broken and damaged. And we bless you, Father, that in your time you sent the Lord Jesus Christ into this world to be our Saviour. We thank you, Father, that he took upon our flesh and he knows and understands each and every one of us better than we know ourselves. He knows our sorrows, he knows our pains, he knows our joys. He knows the things that cause us to be worried and anxious. He knows our fears. And Lord, we thank you that we can indeed turn to you at any time in whatever situation we find ourselves in and cry out to you and know that we have a God of love and compassion who cares for us and who delights to respond to the cries of his people. And yet, Father, as we so often We confess that so often we try to uh, handle life and its difficulties in our own, in our own strength, by our own wisdom. And yet the truth is, without you, we can do nothing. But with you, the things that seem impossible become possible. For you are the God of impossible situations. You are the God who cares for us and provides for us. We thank you for our salvation, secured by Jesus on the cross when he bore our burden of sin. We thank you that he triumphed over death and the grave and rose victorious, and that through him we have hope for this life and hope for life eternal when life here is over. Father, help us to trust you more. Help us, Lord, to uh, exercise our faith that it might strengthen. We pray that you will uh, deal with our doubts, deal with our unbelief, and encourage us by your word this day as we read and study it together that we may know your spirit ministering to us in our particular situations. Lord, we thank you for how you have been with us over these difficult months and this difficult year and a bit, how you have kept and protected us. And we pray, Lord, that as things further relax, as far as the restrictions are concerned, that We wouldn't take these freedoms for granted, but that we would be wise and sensible and continue to be careful, for we know that COVID hasn't gone away. We thank you for our health service and for all those who have been working to uh, alleviate uh, this dreadful disease. We thank you for the rollout of the vaccination program and the success of it here on our islands. And we pray, Father, that those who continue to work with the varying new variants, that 
You will grant them success and understanding uh, as they seek to develop even better ways of, of dealing with this illness. Lord, we pray for those who would like to be with us but who are still fearful of coming into a crowd. We pray that they will know your presence with them in their homes or wherever they may be watching. We pray that you will encourage them and that they will place their trust in you and you alone. We pray, Father, that as things continue to uh, further relax, that we will use the fresh opportunities you give us to share our faith more boldly with a world around us and a community in which we live that needs to know the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of salvation. So, Lord, hear our prayer, we pray, and pardon our sins, and hear us as we say together the words of the prayer you taught your disciples, as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever. Amen. I'm going to read from God's Word, uh, from this Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, if you've got your Bibles and like to turn to that. We'll commence to read at verse 14. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He has already in the previous chapter told his disciples of some of the events that are going to happen there. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be put to death. But on the third day, he will rise again. And as he progresses towards Jerusalem, we see him encountering different folk and different situations and our reading today is an account of one of these encounters which he had. So commencing to read at verse 14. When he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them, and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed, and running to him greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? That's well, the disciples. Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who is a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you can, believe all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out of him. And he said, and became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciple asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, 
This kind cannot come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Then they departed from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know it, for he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. But they did not understand this saying, and were afraid to ask him. We pray that God will add his blessing to this reading of his word for his namesake and glory. Amen. I'm going to sing again, this time from the church hymnry. It's 359. 359, the hymn, Son of God, Eternal Savior, Source of Life and Truth and Grace, Son of Man, whose birth incarnate hallows all our human race. Thou art head who enthroned in glory, for thine own dost ever plead. Fill us with thy love and pity, heal our wrongs and help our need. Let us stand and praise God. to our prayer of intercession for others and uh, as those of you who regularly attend here in St. Columbus will know that each July we normally have a special Sea Sunday service when we particularly remember all those who uh, serve us by working at sea in one capacity or other. And I understand the lifeboat are having a special week uh, this week so do support them 
with their activities uh, down by the harbour. So we want to remember uh, this Sunday uh, all those who work at sea and hopefully by next year things will be back to normal and we'll be able to have uh, many representatives from the lifeboat, from our fishermen and overseas or offshore workers as well as our Coast Guard joining with us. But uh, do you remind them that we remember them in our prayer. So let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God of heaven and earth, the one who created this world and all within it, the one who has created the seas and the oceans, the one who has ordained their currents and tides and set everything in its place and declared it to be good. Lord, today we want to especially remember all those who uh, serve us by working at sea. We remember our merchant seamen and women who sail the oceans of the world to bring supplies from countries around the globe to meet our needs. We thank you for their uh, dedication to their, their, their work and for the long hours and indeed sometimes months that they're away from home and from loved ones. We pray for them and pray for their families. As we think of them, we remember too the men and women of our Royal Navy, as they too seek to protect us from foreign foes and also to bring aid and assistance in places of times of disaster. Lord, we know that they too have many months away from loved ones you know the difficulties of living in intense and sometimes cramped conditions in difficult and challenging seas and difficult and challenging political situations in the waters in which they sail. We pray for their protection. We pray that they will know that the Creator God is the one who is in control, one to whom they can turn at any time. We thank you for our ferry operators here in the Calmac that bring the, the goods and enable us to travel backwards and forwards to the mainland. We pray for them and for their families and particularly for the difficulties experienced now with the restrictions that are limiting the numbers of people they can accommodate. We pray that another ferry will be provided by the government to enable uh, capacity to be reached once again. We thank you for our fishermen, those who work our local waters, those who work on our fish farms, those who work in deep sea to bring catches to the shores for, to feed the people. Lord, you know the the wild weather that they often have to face, the difficult conditions which they have to endure. Lord, help them to look to you, the one who knows each and every individual, the one who cares for each and every individual, the one who desires a personal relationship with each and every one. We pray that you will indeed give them success in their work. You know, the difficulties that they are facing because of Brexit and the, the new regulations and the difficulties in exporting uh, some of their produce to markets on, on, in Europe. We pray that government will indeed step in and seek to resolve the situation for the benefit of all. We thank you too, Father, for all those connected with this congregation and all those from this island who work offshore in the oil industry and the gas industry in order to ensure that we have the energy that we need uh, to meet uh, the requirements of modern life. We pray too that they will be protected. Again, Lord, you know the difficulties when... Uh, dangers occur. 
when illness breaks out or there's a COVID outbreak on a rig, you know, the impact that has on the whole production of the platform. We thank you for all those who service our rigs, those who fly our men backwards and forwards from Aberdeen. We pray that they will be kept safe. And Lord, we remember those who seek to meet uh, the needs of uh, all those who work at sea. We think of port chaplains and missionaries. We think of the work of the fishermen's mission, the seafarer's mission, the mission to deep sea fishermen and others. Lord, grant them success as they seek to engage with the men and women often who are far from home and experiencing challenges and difficulties because of their work. Enable them to bring not only practical help to these people, but spiritual help as well. For we know that without you, none of us can do anything. We know that without you, there is always a void and going to be a void in our lives. Only you can fill that void. Only you can satisfy. So we pray for them in their work of spiritual care and practical care for our mariners. We remember, too, our emergency services, the work of the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, our Coast Guard and the other emergency services. We commend them to your care and keeping as they respond uh, often in very challenging and dangerous situations to meet the needs of those who are in distress in order to bring hope, to bring rescue, to bring comfort. We thank you for the work of the Northern Lighthouse Board and the work it does in maintaining our lighthouses and all the navigational aids around our coasts to enable our mariners to sail safely. Grant them success as they continue to maintain these aids to navigation. Lord, we just commend the families of all those who work at sea to your care as well, remembering especially families that have been bereaved of loved ones through losing someone through their work at sea. Grant them your comfort. May they know your enabling uh, peace and presence to strengthen them day by day as they face the future. We remember too, Lord, those in our own community and congregation who have been bereaved in recent days. We uphold them before you and pray that your Holy Spirit, the Comforter, will draw close and bring that peace which is beyond all understanding. We remember those who are uh, undergoing tests, those undergoing or waiting for scans of one form or another those who have undergone surgery or who are awaiting surgery, those who are recovering from surgery, we commend them to you and pray, Lord, that in their time of need and difficulty, they will look to you, the one who healed while here on earth and the one who still heals as we reach out to him in faith and hope. We thank you for this reading that we have read and as we think of this young boy so distressed by his epilepsy and the demon possession, we remember all our young people and pray for your protection of them. We pray especially, Father, for children and for infants who are in hospital undergoing surgery, those who are seriously ill in need of medical care. We commend them and their parents and wider families to your care and keeping. And thank you for our health services and for the skills of the pediatricians and the, those in the sick children's hospital who care for them. Give them the gifts and the wisdom and the talents they need in dealing with these little ones. For we are reminded by your word that when you're here on earth, how you reached out and lifted them up in your arms and blessed them. 
So, Father, hear our prayer and undertake for us as we turn now shortly to your word. We pray that you will open our hearts and minds to receive it and to respond to it, that we might leave here encouraged and strengthened and renewed in our faith so that we can serve you better in the week that lies ahead. Hear our prayer, for we make it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I'm going to sing again from Mission Praise this time, just before we come to God's Word. It's 828. It's Noel and Tricia Richards' hymn, Filled with Compassion for All Creation. Jesus came into a world that was lost. There was but one way that he could save us, only through suffering death on a cross. Let us stand and praise God.
We've all been through difficult times this past year and a bit through this COVID pandemic. I want to ask you this morning, how strong is your faith? Has your faith been strengthened by the experiences you've had over this last 18 months? As you sit in church this morning and you think about your faith, how much has your faith grown in the last year? Perhaps you've yet to make a commitment to the Lord Jesus and accept him as your Savior and begin the journey of faith. If that's where you find yourself this morning, I encourage you to listen to God's word and commence that journey today. Our Christian life is one of mountains and valleys. It's one of ups and downs. One of glorious mountaintop spiritual experience and one of the harsh reality of our earthly existence with all of its pain, all of its sorrow and struggle for daily survival. We all have times when our faith is beset by doubts times when we struggle to understand the battle that's raging in us and around us. In the reading that we have read here in Mark's Gospel, Jesus had just come down from the top of the mountain of transfiguration along with his disciples, Peter, James, and John. It was an amazing experience for them all time when Jesus was transfigured, when he heard his father affirm and his calling and declare his love for his son and for the work that he had sent him to do. A time when Jesus was ministered to by Moses and Elijah and Peter, James and John as mere mortals had the privilege of witnessing the scene. It was an occasion of glorious divine revelation, an occasion that was a foretaste of the glory yet to come for all believers. It was indeed a moment of special communion with God the Father. And yet from that mountaintop experience, Jesus and the disciples come off the mountain, down from the glory of the experience, and he is hit immediately faced with the reality of spiritual conflict, having to deal with demon possession, having to deal with a people who were arguing. From the company of Moses and Elijah, he's thrown into the arguments and unbelief between his disciples and the scribes. From that foretaste of heaven, He's faced with the reality of the physical agony of a child and the emotional and mental distress of a distraught father, as well as the feeble disciples' lack of power in the face of evil satanic power. The men who had been with him so long were helpless in their own strength. And surely this scene is an emblem of the contrast that Jesus faced when he voluntarily left glory to come to this earth, to live and dwell amongst us as a man in order to secure our salvation by dying on Calvary's cross and taking God's righteous wrath that we deserved. Surely it's also a picture of the true Christian life where work, conflict, weakness, and sorrow are the rule. And visions of glory tend to be the exception. Friends, if there's any lesson for us here, whatever, wherever we are on our journey of faith, it must surely be that without Jesus we can do nothing. But with Jesus all things are possible no matter how impossible they may look to the world and look to us. 
This young boy's affliction was greatly aggravated by demon possession. And the father, as you can imagine, had probably tried every possible known doctor and healer to see if he could find a cure for his son. He had probably spent his life savings to try and have his son cured. And he brings him to Jesus, hearing Jesus is in the area. But of course, when he gets there, he discovers that Jesus has gone up the mountain and he appeals to the disciples who are still there at the foot of the mountain and asks them to heal him. And they tried, but they couldn't. And you can sense this father's desperation as he appeals to Jesus. The boy's condition was a risk to his very life, already having him caused him to fall into fire and into water on previous occasions. The father was ready to try anything to have his son healed. His only son, as Luke tells us in his account. And Jesus' reply to the father was not intended as a rebuke. Rather, the Lord wanted to encourage the man to believe in God's power. If it is possible, said Jesus, Everything is possible to the one who has faith, he says. Do you believe that this morning in your own personal situation, whatever it may be? That everything is possible to someone who has faith. And the Father's response to Jesus is surely one of the most honest and realistic prayers in the Bible. In the New King James, we read, Lord, I believe. Help my own belief. The New International Version has it. I do believe. Help me overcome my own belief. And the message paraphrase says, Then I believe. Help me with my doubts. Or the Living Bible paraphrase says, I do have faith. Oh, help me to have more. As we consider this passage, I want you firstly to notice the deficiency of faith in the whole situation. It wasn't just the father whose faith fell short. It was a generic problem of all the people who were there. The scribes, they didn't believe in Jesus' full stop. The spiritually oppressed and the disciples all demonstrate a lack of faith. And this is surely something that's especially prevalent in our own society today, where it's okay to have faith if you keep it a private matter, restrict it to your own home, but don't dare bring it out into the public square. But you know, even as Christians, that we too can harbor doubts about the power of God to intervene in our situations in spite of us confessing that Jesus is Lord. And that's part of our fallen nature, for our bodies haven't yet been perfected as God's children and won't be until Jesus returns and we receive our new resurrection bodies. True believers can have both faith and unbelief mixed in the same heart, trust mixed with doubts, Hope existing with fear. The nine disciples that had been left behind when Jesus went up the mountain were quite helpless. They couldn't do a thing to help the poor boy. And the father complained to Jesus, I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they couldn't. It was a failure of faith. These same men had been given power and authority over evil spirits by Jesus as he sent them out on their first mission assignment back in Mark chapter 6. And they had gone out on that assignment and they had exercised their faith and they had witnessed the effectiveness of Christ's authority and been able to cast out many demons. No wonder Jesus was disappointed with them. Oh, faithless generation, how long am I to bear with you 
he challenged them. It was apparent from our reading that all the people shared the disciples' lack of faith. The disciples, the scribes, the Father, indeed the whole crowd are included in Jesus' condemnation. I wonder how pleased or otherwise Jesus is with us today. With such a lack of faith, miracles are impossible. You remember how Jesus was unable to do any wonders or miracles in his hometown of Nazareth. Why? Because of the people's unbelief. And you can read of that in Luke 4. They lacked faith. And Jesus couldn't work there. And he left the area. Friends, is that why we see so few miracles and wonders in our day and generation? How deficient is our faith in our 21st century society, which is so secular and materialistic with little or no time for God and His Word? And the props that supported our forebears have been knocked out from under us. Belief in a living and active God who desires a personal relationship with each and every person is sneered at by our generation. It's interesting and significant. That the Lord Jesus links on belief with the bent of our human heart towards evil. There's a twist in human nature that makes us prefer our independence, makes us prefer going our own way, trying to handle things in our own strength rather than stepping out and venturing on the commitment of faith and trusting Him and Him alone completely. God's Word tells us our hearts are deceitful above all things and incurably sick. We spend our time deceiving ourselves. We fail to realize the necessity of our complete faith and trust in God and our total dependence on Him and Him alone. And we continue to try to cope in our own frail human strength as if it depended on us instead of us casting our burdens on him who has promised to sustain us when we do. This deficiency of faith afflicted this first century society, and including Jesus' disciples. This deficiency of faith still afflicts our society today, including those who profess to believers at times. And the church, friends, is the weaker as a result. And it means that we fail to be the salt and the light that we've been called to be by our Lord and Master. There's a deficiency of faith in the story. But secondly, notice, not only was there a deficiency of faith, notice the doability of faith. Jesus said, everything is possible. Everything is possible to the one who is faith. Faith isn't passive. Faith is active. And when faith is exercised, amazing things, extraordinary things happen. Things that can only be explained by the power of God working through his faithful, believing people. And the boy's father, when he appealed to Jesus, had placed that if into his question. That element of doubt into the situation. Yes, the disciples had failed to heal his boy. He was questioning, could Jesus himself now help? If it is possible, have compassion us and help us, he pleads. Friends, there are no ifs or buts in this matter of faith. Faith believes that all things are possible. And if you read on into the next chapter, chapter 10, our Lord has to answer a question of his disciples when they ask, 
who then can be saved? And his reply, for men it's impossible, but not for God. For with God all things are possible. However hopeless a situation or circumstance may be, that's the faith that can move mountains. It's the faith that refuses to admit that any obstacle is insurmountable. Wesley wrote in one of his hymns so aptly, Faith, he says, mighty faith the promise sees and looks to thee alone, laughs at the impossibilities and cries it shall be done. Do you believe that I can? Jesus asked the Father. In your situation this morning, as you cry out to God, do you believe that he can intervene and help? There's no doubt about Christ's ability. Of course he can do it. How many people he had healed in his ministry up to this point? The disciples had witnessed it. The crowds had witnessed it. The scribes had witnessed it. But unless I believe, believe him and act in that belief, it's not for me. Hudson Taylor, the intrepid missionary to inland China, discovered time after time in his experience three different stages in a work for God. When God asked him to do something, firstly, it was impossible. From a human perspective, it didn't make sense. It was totally impossible. Secondly, as he stepped out in faith, he discovered it was difficult. But as he persevered and pressed on in faith, he discovered it was done. Impossible, difficult, and done. That's faith, friends, and it works as we step out trusting Jesus for the impossible. With total faith in our all-powerful God, all things are possible. We have a deficiency of faith in this story. But we also see the doability of faith in the story. And thirdly, notice the development of faith. I have faith, the Father cries. Help me where my faith falls short. Help my unbelief, is his cry. That's not the blank unbelief of the Nazarenes Jesus in Jesus' hometown where nothing could happen because of people's lack of faith. In this father, we see the germination of seeds of faith in the heart of a man who is seeking God's help. It's there as a grain of mustard seed, but it needs, like any seed, to be nurtured. It needs to be fanned into a flame. In this Father's faith, there's but a tiny glow. But the Lord seizes on that tiny spark and responds in compassion and love to heal his child. The Father had earnestly prayed for faith. Any lurking hesitations and doubt he wanted removed from his life. He desired all that the Lord had for him and didn't want to be held back by his own human failings. Oh, for a faith that will not shrink, was the hymn writer's plea. And that should be our plea as well. A faith that will not shrink, despite seemingly impossible odds. And friends, it doesn't matter how small our faith is to start with. We can pray that it will grow and that God will increase it. And when we do ask him, he will. He'll stretch our faith. He'll test our faith. He'll exercise our faith. And he'll develop and strengthen our faith as we look to him and rely on him. 
You remember that elderly woman with the hemorrhage afflicted for many years. And she just managed to touch the trailing hem of our Lord's cloak. She only had a little faith. She knew if she touched his cloak, she would be healed, and she was. Her little faith led to her being made whole and healed when she exercised it. I have some faith, confessed the boy's father. Yeah, it may not have been much, but it was the basis of his prayer. Help my unbelief. The gospel invitation is simply to commit as much as we know of ourselves to as much as we know of Christ. If you're prepared to do that and ask that your faith may be increased, the Lord will see to the rest. The faith we have, however small, however fragile, however weak, will indeed grow as we exercise it and use it. And God will ensure that it develops and will mature. All we have to do is to confess our belief and ask for his help and resist unbelief. Finally, notice the demand of faith. After the Lord had healed the boy and returned him to his father, we're told by Mark he went into a house along with his disciples, where in private the disciples began to quiz him. Why couldn't we get rid of the demon, they asked? Why couldn't we cast out the demon? Following their earlier success on their first mission, they were genuinely concerned about their inability and their ineffectiveness in this particular situation. Mark tells us that the Lord replied, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but by prayer and fasting. Matthew in his account says, Jesus told them, your faith is too weak. And both sayings are complementary because prayer and faith belong together. To pray is to believe, and to believe is to pray. Both prayer and faith look only to the Lord and rely on him alone. Jesus rebuked the disciples for their lack of prayer and for their lack of faith. If they had prayed, they would have realized the need for faith. If they had exercised their faith, they would have realized their need for prayer. It's people of faith who pray. People of faith who pray and see God bring results. The challenge of faith lies in the fact that it can be exercised on behalf of others. When the father cried, I have faith, Help me where my faith falls short. Then his son was healed as Jesus responded to his faith and his prayer. The reason the disciples couldn't perform the miracle was not because of unbelief of the boy or unbelief of the father. It was because of their own unbelief and their own lack of prayer. And what a responsibility that places on us Surely here is the cause of the main reason for our failure. Our faith is weak. Our prayer lives are not what they should be. We have God-given gifts, but we fail to use them. We have God's Word so readily available to us, and we neglect to read it and study it in order to nourish our souls as we ought to. We have the power of prayer to bring all God's resources into our situation. And so often we don't exert it. 
How pleased is God with his church today? Do we truly realize that our faith can help to bring others to Christ, to saving faith? Likewise, our lack of faith can prevent and hinder others from coming. It's a solemn reality check. Remember earlier in Mark's gospel, there's the story of four friends who carried their paralytic pal to Jesus on a stretcher. So eager were they to get him to Jesus that they climbed onto the roof because of the crowd, opening up the roof so that they could lower the man to Jesus' feet. What did the gospel writer tell us? When Jesus saw their faith, he turned to the paralyzed man and he said, My son, your sins are forgiven. He was brought to faith through the faith of his friends. His life was transformed spiritually. And then Jesus went on and healed him physically. God, grant that we may leave this service here this morning with a renewed faith in our almighty, all-powerful God, with a faith that is totally depending on Him for whom all things are possible. So let us step out in faith into the week ahead and be prepared to exercise our faith and share it with others as God gives us opportunity. Let us use the gifts and talents that God has blessed us with for His glory, for the benefit of His people in this congregation, in this community. Because as we do step out in faith and in prayer, we can expect miracles of grace to abound in our midst. Miracles of grace that will grow and mature and strengthen our faith still further, bringing transformation not only to our lives, but to our whole community. We pray that it will be so. For God's word to each one of us this morning is that all things are possible for the one who believes. All things are possible for the one who believes. Amen. As we come to conclude our service together, we do it with the words of the familiar hymn, hymn of Joseph Scriven. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry. All because we do not exercise our faith and take everything to him in prayer. Let us stand and praise God.
may the peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, guard our hearts and our thoughts in Christ Jesus. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and evermore. Amen. <laughs>